There is one reliable, as well as manifestly humane to, uh, way to do it, and that is to raise the standard of living of the poorest so that it comes up above the poverty line. And in every nation where this has been achieved, regardless of the availability or non-availability of contraception or baby butchering or all the other devices for interfering in nature's way, the population has tended towards mere replacement late rate rather than rampant growth. And so the problem that I have, the central problem, with the Agenda 21 proposal, as it is put forward by the UN, in the documents which are now being treated by the totalitarian left as their new gospel, is that these documents would make the whole world poorer and would therefore paradoxically achieve precisely the opposite of the intended depopulation effect by bringing about an increase in the population of the very poorest and of course of humanity as a whole. So it's not just that the message of Agenda 21 is politically undesirable and prescriptive and dirigiste and centraliste and étatiste in the extreme. Funny how the French have all the words <laughs> for this kind of thing. It is also, at the economic level, completely wrong-headed. What it will do is increase the human population, increase human misery considerably, and achieve precisely the opposite of whatever genuinely pious effect may have been intended, and that's a big stretch to assume that they did intend a pious effect, but let's pretend. It will simply vitiate any such pious intent by causing this huge increase in population. So how have we come to this pass? Go back to Imperial China. And early Imperial China first defined and meditated upon the fundamental divide in the politics of the world, which is a divide between what the Chinese called the legalists we would call them totalitarians, socialists, national socialists, international socialists, communists, Marxists, fascists, they're all the same. The people who know better than we do how our lives should be run and wish to prescribe it down to the very last detail by force if necessary, including what kind of light bulb you can use. On the one hand, the legalists, and on the other, what the Chinese called the Confucians. Now anyone who has read the Analects of Confucius cannot but be impressed by the generosity of spirit that the great philosopher of ancient China displayed. And he was, you can see this in the way he meditates upon what is virtue and what isn't. He was a libertarian. He was a live and let live kind of guy. Don't interfere unless you really have to. Leave it to people to work it out for themselves. That was his philosophy. And they called that the Confucian philosophy. We would call it the free market philosophy. Freedom loving, democracy loving, liberty loving. The conservative philosophy, if you like. That is the central divide. And what is happening now is that the extreme legalist, or the extreme left, or whatever label you want to put, they have grown tired of democracy. It was once seen by some of them as a good thing. Now they see it as poison, because what it does is to give the individual the right to choose for himself what government he shall have, what laws shall be imposed upon him, and what taxes he shall endure. And they want to do that for us. So they don't want that liberty to exist any longer. And they want to take democracy away. They've already done it in Europe, by setting up the European Union and with annual treaties transferring more and more power away from elected hands to unelected hands. And whatever other benefits may come of this, the loss of democracy in Europe is now near total. And it is European advisers 
who are telling the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change how to use exactly the same techniques of annual agreements, they can't call them treaties because the US Senate, thank goodness, went past them, so as to transfer power inexorably away from free nations such as Canada towards the new centralist dictatorship worldwide this time with no chance of competition or extinction that they wish to create. And you may say, as members of the International Free Press Society, what has the press to say about this? Well, let me quote what they say about this. <laughs> they have nothing to say. They are near totally, culpably silent. Give you one little vignette to illustrate just how near unanimously silent they are when confronted with this growing power grab by the legalist class politique to take power from the ordinary yous and me's of the world. In Durban last December there was the latest of the annual UN climate gab fests at which, just like all the previous ones, a written agreement was produced transferring yet more power from the hands of elected uh, countries where they have them to the unelected central regime. And among the provisions in this exciting document of several hundred turgid pages of UN bureaucraties described by the UN's former head of the Documentation Centre as transparent impenetrability, <laughs> they said that they were going to set up an international climate court to which only Western countries could be dragged because they hadn't paid enough Danegeld to the UN Framework Convention, which effectively would become the new world government. Only Western countries could be hauled before this international climate court. And, of course, troublemakers like Moncton, who say there isn't that much of a problem with the climate, and even if there was, it would be cheaper to do nothing about it. They were also going to give rights of legal personality to Mother Earth. Mother Earth, God bless her, if you go to Tibet, and you go to the largest mountain overlooking Tibet, its name in Tibetan is Tsumulang Ma. This means Goddess Mother Earth. Well, hey, those people in Tibet might like to know the Goddess Mother Earth now has rights of legal personality. She can sue. And this is very much part of the theme of the Agenda 21, which is that we must give rights to the birds and the trees. And they must now be able to sue in the person of any busybody who wants to intervene and say that any capitalist enterprise that wishes to cut down a tree or build a factory is harming the planet and must be stopped and hauled before the International Climate Court. So that was another of the ludicrous proposals. There's just one more I'll mention. And that is that the carbon dioxide concentration of the planet, now approaching 400 parts per million by volume on average. It's probably about 1,100 in here just at the moment because I'm talking rather a lot and <laughs> emitting a fair amount. They were going to cut that from 400 to 200 parts per million by volume. And the effect of that reduction would have been to reduce the net primary productivity of plants and trees so very greatly because CO2 is their food that many species would have died out altogether all would have become less productive and mass starvation not only of humans but of animals feeding upon these plants and trees would inevitably result. But that was one of the options actually listed for serious discussion in this draft conclusions of the conference. Now how many of you have heard any of those provisions mentioned in any mainstream news medium that you have seen? No. And there is the test, not a hand goes up. Because these provisions, which were in the document, were not mentioned, as far as I could discover, by any news medium whatsoever. They were all there at Durban. Not one mentioned the whole purpose of this conference, 
which was to decide upon this particular document. So, I got into the conference. I was a registered delegate. They tried to keep me out, even so. So I hired a plane and parachuted in. And then they couldn't keep me out. And I got hold of this document and got out before they could stop me and went straight to put it up on the web. And two days later, WordPress, that runs the blogs all around the world and posts up 500,000 blog postings every day, got in touch and they said, we get in touch every day with the one person who has received more hits to his blog posting than any of the others we've posted that day. And number one that day was Moncton just telling people what was in the negotiating document. Now, I'm not telling this story to say, how clever am I? Well, yes, I am, but I'm also uh, telling the story to say, why did no newspaper or other medium utter a word of this until I had, and even then virtually none of them did. It is because the newspapers themselves have largely been taken over by a narrow political faction, the legalists again, and they would regard it as contrary to their political views to allow the truth of this matter, or of any matter related to it, such as we're not getting the amount of warming the IPCC predicted, etc., etc., ever to be mentioned where a, a large number of readers could ever hope to see it. Now, as Albert Camus said, a free press may be either good or bad, but without freedom, it cannot be anything but bad. Now, my question is this. We can't regulate the press, but we can perhaps compete with this near-universal Marxism among the newspaper. Fox News in the United States has just posted its annual profits. They made $2 million a day. How did they do it? From a standing start 17 years ago, they now have more than half the news audience of the United States. All the various Marxist channels, there are 14 or 15 of them, are having to compete for the rest of the advertising revenue. So I don't think we need to regulate the press, because that will take away any hope of freedom and will make them every bit as bad as Camus was suggesting. But I do think that certainly here in Canada you've begun this with some media beginning to compete. In Australia and in the United Kingdom we're work working now on plans to do the same. We will compete with these people. We will provide the alternative message of peace and freedom and prosperity and hope. We will not be stopped and we will simply defeat them in the old-fashioned way by competing with them commercially. Thank you. It's all part of the same nexus. Global warming is, is the one they had hoped would be the mainspring that would achieve it all for them. Then the likes of me came along and said, uh, excuse me, but uh, <coughs> the emperor has no clothes. This doesn't add up. And they found that it only took a few of us to bring the whole bandwagon to a halt. So they all jumped onto the sustainability bandwagon into which they will subsume the global warming thing and it will gradually fade away. And so it's all part of the same process. They just need always an excuse to shut down the West, yes. to reduce us back to the level of... of, of